sorry. All right. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> so we're going to continue working through our very slow walk through the book of Revelation. Uh, we started looking at what is called the seven seals. Remember, seven seals are upon this scroll. Uh, oops, that's what I'm looking for. Okay. Um, yeah, seven seals are upon the scroll that's in the right hand of God. The right hand of God uh, had this scroll, and Jesus was found to be the one that was worthy to, to open it. And so <clears throat> we don't even know what's on the scroll yet. We can't even see it yet. We're just, we're just breaking off the seals of this, okay? We're, just, we're taking off the, uh, you know, the plastic wrap off of something before we actually get to see on the inside, okay? So um, the point that I tried to make just to kind of get us to focus on, you know, what in the world is going on and how we even frame this into everything that's taking place here, um, it's very likely that what is on this scroll that God wants to reveal uh, involves his will, his plans, and his purposes, who is the one person that is wholly qualified to reveal the plans and purposes and will of God? Well, that's Jesus Christ, who is a lion and he's a lamb. And so Jesus has now taken the scroll and he's breaking off the seals. And it seems that what we're seeing with the breaking of these seals um, is a way to prepare us as listeners, as readers of Revelation for the contents of the scroll. Okay, so we want to learn what is the will of God that he would have us to know? Well, in order to prepare us, we're seeing what these uh, these various seals are doing and accomplishing, okay? So that's kind of framing, that's where we are in the big picture, okay? Now, last time we also talked about how um, that when Revelation gives these uh, these various groups of seven, whether it's the seven seals or the seven trumpets or the seven bowls, that they are organized in a pattern of the first four being their own group and the last three being their own group, which is why the last time when I taught, uh, I just focused on the first four because the first four were four riders. They were riders on four horses, okay? So within seven seals, you don't get seven riders. You only get four riders, okay? So we should not expect five, six, and seven to be the same as riders. They're going to be doing something a little bit different, but they are still accomplishing the same purpose, which is that they are trying to prepare us as listeners, as readers, for the contents of the scroll. So they are putting us in anticipation, okay? <clears throat> and what we did see with the four riders um, was a variety of seemingly unsettling images, okay? Um, and so I just kind of got the, uh, is the, um, are you guys able to see my, uh, the Bible work screen in front of you? Just making sure that everything's showing up here. Of course, I can't see. Um, if, if you if you do, just thumbs up so I can see. Okay, good. All right, good. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, so we saw, like in the first the first uh, seal in verse two, we had a white horse which demonstrated conquering and conquest, and of course, this would make uh, any of those Christians, by the way, because people that are reading this and hearing this, they're, they're they're believers. Okay, these are people in the churches. Okay, but any Christian that might have compromised with the Roman Empire with worshiping the emperor uh, and thus divided their allegiance between God and lamb on the one hand and worshiping the emperor on the other hand, this would have made them feel very uncomfortable because the Roman empire heralded and promised everybody that they had brought this universal peace, the Roman peace, the Pax Romana. Then we have the second horse, which is, uh, looks like it's war, uh, the red horse. Um, and uh, it, that it says there in a, a six in verse four, um, that it was granted to take peace from the earth. So, of course, that Roman peace could be taken away with war. Of course, we know from hindsight over the last 1900 years, there have been lots and lots of wars in the world, okay? So any sort of peace that Rome promised definitely didn't last, okay? Third horse, we have famine. Uh, famine being something that affects a lot of people, and, and that's, just, that's just unfortunate, okay? Because food... Um, is an issue. Uh, and it's actually one of the problems today is that although in the world today there is enough food in the world for everyone to be practically overweight, there are still uh, people that die of malnourishment every single day. Okay, so uh, basically the world has the means of dealing with the problems of famine 
um, it hasn't quite done that yet. Um, people die every day because they don't have enough food, despite the fact that there isn't a food in the world. <clears throat> so that's an ongoing issue. And, you know, if conquest isn't going to get you, if war is not going to get you, if famine is not going to get you, then the fourth force of death, that's going to get you. Okay, so because everyone's going to die at some point unless Jesus returns in our own lifetime. So all these things out here would have made anyone that felt a little bit too comfortable um, and not having placed their reliance upon God, putting their reliance upon the Lamb and upon the kingdom of God. And, of course, Revelation is also trying to give us, <clears throat> excuse me, this imagery of New Jerusalem. Anyone that has not placed their hopes and trust and faith on those things will feel very uneasy about the threat of conquest, the threat of war, the removal of peace, um, famine, and then ultimately death. Okay, so that's kind of where we are. And now we're moving on to the fifth seal. Okay, so that's what's going to be in verses 9 through 11. And actually... We're just going to finish chapter 6. In chapter 6, we only get the first six seals, okay? All of chapter 6. Just going to, just going to give you an idea. So we got the introduction of seven seals. All of chapter 6 deals with seals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, okay? And then we kind of have this long pause, this long interlude. And in chapter 7, you have this long pause between seals 6 and 7. And it stops and it makes you think and it puts you on the edge of your seat. You're waiting. You're in anticipation. You're wondering what's going on. And so the function of putting that big pause there, that big interlude there, um, will help us to think about the implications of the six seals and what's going to happen with the seventh seal. Okay. Uh, and so rhetorically, that would be very, very powerful. So we're going to ask the question, once we get done reading this today, the question that really is important, which is, how does this make us feel? How does this make us feel? Because how these words made people feel um, was an intended effect. It's actually, you remember in Revelation 1 and verse 3, it says, blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and those who keep it. Okay, So we're blessed if we listen to this and if we keep, we hold, we maintain the message that's within it. So asking the question, how does this make us feel when we hear it is, is an important question and an intended question for us to be asking. Okay. So we'll look at the fifth seal here. Okay, so we got this the scroll, and he's just slowly breaking off seals one by one. <clears throat> okay, fifth seal. All right. So uh, let's see. So verses nine through. I'm just we're gonna go just kind of one seal at a time. Okay, verses nine through eleven. And so you'll just, you'll listen to the seal, and you're gonna think, wow, this sounds really different from Four Horsemen. Okay. So we have there in verse uh, nine. Let me move my picture over a little bit. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain, literally those who had been slaughtered, because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice. I want you to kind of remember that, that multiple people are crying out, but collectively with one single loud voice, saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until, and you'll notice here that this, this little phrase is actually in italics, okay? And so I don't think actually the part that's in italics, well, I know it's not in the Greek text, but uh, the Greek text is a little confusing. Um, so I'm not going to read the italics part because I think uh, that confuses what's here. Okay, so it is until their fellow servants and the brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. Okay, we're looking for a completion, an, an act of completion of the servants and the brothers and sisters who were to be killed as they were. Okay, so... What is the fifth seal? The fifth seal here um, deals with martyrs, deals with Christian martyrs, okay? These are Christian martyrs. How do we know they're Christian martyrs? Because they were killed specifically because, in verse 9, and, and it's actually a very important kind of causal preposition, they were killed, they were slaughtered on account of the word of God and the testimony which they had maintained. And those are 
<clears throat> I'll, I'll put it up here, just kind of make it easier for people to see. Okay, um, right there, the word of God and the testimony they had maintained, those are meant to be kind of two kind of further developing points. It's not two things, it's not the word of God and the testimony, it's the word of God, namely the testimony which they had maintained. And the word for testimony is the noun where we get the word witness, the word martyrion, okay, the word witness, okay? Um, and so they, they maintain their witness, okay? They were faithful witnesses to the word of God. Now notice here, I, I again have to keep making this point, um, the word of God here is not the Bible. The word of God is the gospel message, okay? It's the gospel message. It's the testimony that they had maintained, okay? They had maintained this responsibility to be faithful preachers of the gospel message, okay? And this is a good thing, okay? I mean, their, their sacrifice is, is, is highlighted here. It's almost like the best thing that's been said in this chapter so far. We've seen kind of negative images between conquest, war, famine, and death. And now we have a promise of vindication for faithful believers, faithful Christians, who have died as martyrs because they were faithfully preaching the gospel message. Now, we know that Jesus himself, Back in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, Jesus himself is called the faithful witness. He is the faithful martyr, okay? So Jesus has already demonstrated himself in the book of Revelation as an example for us, as someone who also was slain, was slaughtered because of the word of God and the testimony that he maintained, okay? So these people are being faithful in following the lamb, okay? They're, in a sense, conquering in the way that Jesus conquered, okay? Now, so that's Jesus being the example, Revelation 1, 5. John, the revelator, is also an example, example number two. In Revelation 1, 9, he says that uh, he was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God, okay? So he was there because of the gospel message, okay? For whatever reason that he was there, I think that he was there for evangelistic purposes. Um, but for whatever reason, the gospel message is something that, that motivated him to be on that island where he received this vision, okay? So we got two examples. And then we have this guy named Antipas, and I think he's in chapter two and verse 13. Let me actually check to make sure I got the right reference there. Uh, this is all review stuff at this point, um, but it's good. Yep, yeah, 2.13, okay. Uh, he did not deny my faith in the days of Antipas, who was my witness, my faithful one. Literally, he is my, my martyr, my faithful one. He is my faithful martyr. He was killed among you. Okay, so this person died as a faithful witness of the gospel message. Okay, so we've got a variety of persons that are that are setting the example, trying to motivate the readers of Revelation, listeners of Revelation, that preaching the gospel, okay, that the gospel message in Jesus' testimony means Jesus' gospel of the kingdom of God, that is a behavior and a practice that is highly valued in the book of Revelation. It is highly valued. It is one of the distinct markers of following Jesus is preaching the gospel that Jesus preached, okay? To the point even to where it's going to cost you something. For these people, it costs them their life, okay? Now, let's be honest. Here in America, in the year 2019, it's not very likely that you're going to be martyred in America for preaching the gospel message, okay? You might lose some friends, you might have some family members that won't talk to you. You might even lose your job. But the likelihood that you're going to be killed for it in our culture, not very likely, okay? But you will very likely suffer some persecution, okay? Uh, you'll definitely have some people that don't want to hear that message, okay? Um, so you can lose something. But these, these people here are praised because they were killed as, as martyrs. They, but they were martyrs as evangelists. Okay, very, very important. Okay, now, notice what they do. Okay, oh, oh sorry, I'm, I'm just, I'm missing all the important points. Okay, so what we see here is that where are these people located? They are located under the altar, under the altar, okay? So when I think of an altar, what do I think about? I think, okay, an altar that is located in a temple, okay? What do we do on an altar? An altar is a place where we bring our sacrifices. What happens with the sacrifices? You, you slaughter them on the altar, and the blood flows over and just falls off of the altar, okay? So now what do we have here? We don't have animals that were sacrificed. We have people, in a sense, who were slaughtered. Because slain is actually not, not the strongest word. It's the word slaughtered. Um, 
So the impression here is that the life that these Christian evangelists that died as martyrs lived was almost an acceptable, I don't want to say a sacrifice to God, but it was a sense of, of right, rightful service to God. God has accepted their life as a sense of service to them, okay? And now remember, Revelation 5.10 says that Jesus has made us a kingdom and priests, okay? We are priests already. So it's not foreign to us that our life, if lived faithfully to God, can be described as something associated with an altar because the altar is where the priest did their acceptable worship and ministering and service to God, okay? So you see the imagery here. The imagery here is that uh, if, if, if these martyrs are located near an altar that means that their life and their service was acceptable to god in a priestly worship serving type of sense okay so it's important for us to think about what does it mean that jesus has made us priests that means that our life is supposed to be an acceptable service and worship and dedication and ministry to god and part of that here is highlighted by the fact that christians who faithfully preach the gospel and who die because of that are linked with an altar. Okay? Very, very important. All right. Um, and so we see the souls that are there. Okay? And soul is just another way of describing the person. Okay? People, they're there um, under the altar. Okay? And notice what they do in verse 10, right here. They cry out with a loud voice. Now, this is a, this is a really important phrase <clears throat> because what we're going to see later, actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Okay? It's, it's almost kind of strange because you would think that if there have been multiple martyrs, because it says multiple souls, okay, and it talks about they, okay, you would think that they would cry out with multiple loud voices. Why is it that Revelation says they have a single loud voice, okay? I'm, I'm going so to give you the – I really want to – it's almost like I want to I hold this secret, and I don't want to tell you so that it's, it's, it's a little bit more impactful, Okay. But I don't want you to forget this. I, I want it's an important point. So when we get to Revelation chapter eleven, okay. So we're moving ahead a little bit. In Revelation eleven and verse three, we have another image, another vision, and we have the vision here. Notice it is for two witnesses, okay. Two witnesses, okay. Now a witness. What, what do they do? They witness with the verb their own testimony, okay. Remember back in, in chapter six and verse nine. We had uh, the martyrs who died because of the word of God and because of the witness, it's the same word here, okay, that they maintain. Okay, so now we got people that are described as witnesses. Of course, we, just, we talk about how preaching the gospel means you witness to one another, okay? And so what do they do? They, they prophesy, okay, so it means they're speaking out, okay? And look down in, um, in verse 5. If anyone wants to harm them, how many are there? Two. Fire flows out of their mouth, not mouths. Fire flows out of their single mouth. Notice here that even these witnesses, plural witnesses, collectively have a singular mouth. They have a singular voice, okay? And actually, the interesting thing here, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, down here in verse 8, okay, where it's, it talks about the, the, these, these, these witnesses also are going to be killed. These witnesses are also going to be martyred because they preach the gospel. But in verse 8, it's actually translated incorrectly. It says dead bodies, their dead bodies. In the Greek, it's actually singular. It's their dead body, one singular body. Collectively, these witnesses have one singular dead body. Collectively, these witnesses have one singular mouth. They have one singular voice. So here, back in chapter 6 and verse 10, they cry out with one singular loud voice, okay? Meaning that the, the witness of the body of Christ, the witness of preaching the gospel, is understood with their call for vindication, their preaching. Uh, they're kind of understood collectively as a singular unit, okay? So, so I'm pointing this out because this, this way of describing a variety of faithful people of God with a singular voice, uh, a singular mouth and a singular body uh, is going to be something that's going to repeat later in Revelation. So it's a thematic point, okay? Uh, people have missed it to the point to where it just even gets translated in the plural in some places, okay, which is wrong. Okay, so what do they do? They cry out with a loud voice. Look at what they're saying, okay? Um, 
and they're basically what they're saying they're asking the question how long how long uh, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell upon the earth okay they're not asking if this is going to happen they're asking when this is going to happen they're not saying god are you going to avenge us god will you avenge us they're saying how long they're basically saying when is this going to happen they are confident that the one who's going to avenge their death is god okay very very important they they trust that that vengeance and wrath is something that that is a privilege that god possesses okay god of course who has handed over judgment to jesus to the lamb also is going to allow the lamb to execute wrath and judgment so we see that in Revelation. But basically, those are the only two persons that have the true authority to do the avenging in Revelation. Okay? So they're asking that question, how long is this going to take place? Okay? Now, I want to, I want to go back and give a little bit of imagery uh, as to what's going on here. Because basically, we have, we have souls. These people are dead. And you're thinking here, okay, how is it that dead people can cry out? Okay? Because we have all been taught, rightfully, that dead people are dead. They're unconscious. They're in the grave. They have no activity, no knowledge, no planning. They're not worshiping God. But here in Revelation, notice we have a vision, a vision of souls underneath the altar crying out for vindication, okay? Is that a contradiction? Does that mean dead people are really alive and are conscious and they can actually speak and cry out to God, okay? Um, no, that's, that's not what's going on here. So this is drawing a lot of imagery from the Old Testament. So first place we'll look at is in back in the beginning, Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, we've got Cain and Abel. Okay. Cain kills Abel. Look at what God says when God's looking for Abel. Genesis 4 and verse 10. He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. His brother's blood is, is crying out. This is, this is obviously the sense of Abel is crying out for vindication. Okay. But no one thinks that his brother's blood is actually alive, conscious, and actually crying out with, with tears. No, we, we get that. We understand what's, what's going on here in Genesis uh, 4 and verse 10. Okay? <clears throat> um, uh, and actually, the same thing actually shows up in, um, in, in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 is that long list of uh, faithful people. Um, uh, yeah, there you go. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. Again, with Cain and Abel. By faith, or in faithfulness, uh, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, um, through which he obtained a testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Okay? That doesn't mean that, that Abel is alive somewhere, consciously talking to us. It's that his example of faithfulness is something that speaks to us and gives us motivation as an example. And of course, that's how we read Hebrews chapter 11, okay? So we can see there's a variety of images in the Bible of, of people that have died, righteous people that have died, and their death serves as an example to motivate faithful, godly behavior for other people. That's what's going on here in Revelation, Okay. When it says that souls are under the altar that are actually talking to God, that doesn't mean that the dead are alive or the dead are conscious. Okay, dead people are dead. How do we know this? Because look at what they're told to do in verse 11. They were told that they should rest. They should sleep. Sleep until we're going to ultimately learn the time of resurrection. Okay, these people are resting. They're asleep. They're dead. They're not really alive. This is poetry. This is part of the vision. It's, it's, it's a way of, of saying that the sacrifices of these Christian martyrs that were faithful preachers of the gospel is a sacrifice that is, one, acceptable to God as faithful priestly service, and two, an example that is intended to motivate other people. That's the point of that particular personification. Okay, So don't let anyone tell you, oh, the Bible in Revelation 6 says that dead people are alive because they can talk. That's, not, that's reading things too literally. We don't do that. Okay, so they're asking God, hey, when is this going to take place? And if you look in verse 11, God doesn't actually give them a good answer. He doesn't, he doesn't tell them when it's going to take place, okay? <clears throat> what he says 
By the way, they're given a white robe, and we know that white robes are the reward for faithful people. White clothing is the reward for faithful people, okay? And they're told, by the way, that they should rest for a little longer. We'll, <clears throat> we'll do a little study on that word rest just to kind of prove the point. Um, until their servants, the brethren, who were to be killed as they were, which is killed and martyred for preaching the gospel, would be completed, okay? So two things I want to kind of focus on here, just kind of make sure. This, this phrase here, the number of those, um, this is one of those things where it was just kind of, it was, it was because the Greek is, is awkward. It's kind of clumsy. Uh, and so the translator thought, well, let's just put that in italics. Maybe that'll help make sense of it. Uh, I don't think that makes any sense of it because I don't think what this passage is saying is that there's, that God has a certain number in his head of the number of martyrs that need to be killed for preaching the gospel. And once it reaches that point, then God's going to vindicate them as if God's got some sort of magic number like, you know, 100,000 or 200,000. I don't think that's what it's being said here. The word number is not here in the Greek text, okay? So this is one of those places where I took a pencil and I just kind of scratched out that phrase. <clears throat> what we're looking for here is for the people to complete the work that they have and to be killed in the same way that the martyrs were killed, okay? So let's just, let's just take the points one at a time. Let's talk about the word rest. Okay. All right. So this is, it's not, it's not the same word for sleeping. It's just a different word, word for rest. Okay. So let me show you how this word gets used <clears throat> in the Bible in some very important context. So I just did a word study on that word rest. We're going to see here, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 13. Daniel 12 verse 13, God says, as for you, Daniel, go your way to the end. Then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age, okay? That is the rest of sleep. That means, Daniel, go your way. You're going to die. You're going to rest, and you're going to rise again in resurrection when? At the end of the age. That's easy, okay? So that's same word, same word here, okay? Remember, Daniel chapter 12 is the very first occurrence that we have in the Bible of clear, unambiguous resurrection theology, okay? Um, elsewhere in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13, we have the same same verb. Notice, by the way, it only shows up twice in Revelation. Revelation 14, 13 says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, blessed are those who are dead. Sorry, sorry, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. Why? So that they may rest, meaning sleep, in death from their labors, and their deeds will follow them. Okay? Notice, they're, they're dead. They die in the Lord. And they're blessed. They're dead. They're called the dead. They die in the Lord and they rest. They sleep. Okay. This is the sleep of death where people are unconscious and they're awaiting resurrection. Okay. So that's what's going on there. These people, these basically, the answer is like, okay, rest, sleep. There's going to be a time coming for resurrection. There's going to be a time coming for vindication. Revelation is not quite going to tell us when that's going to take place yet. We're going to see it later, like way later, like way in like chapter 20 later when that's going to take place, but they're told, hey, you know what? God's got it taken care of. You're identified with the faithful people. You've got some white robes. You're told to rest, but what we also are seeing here is that there needs to be a completion. Um, look at this word here, completion, uh, where it is. Okay, yeah, so this is the word translated for completion, okay, and we're going to see it's only going to appear in Revelation, looky here, two times, okay, the only other time is in Revelation 3 and verse 2, where Jesus says, Wake up, strengthen the things that remain, which are about to die. I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. What does Revelation here say? It says that we are waiting for your servants and the brethren to complete something. What are they to complete? Well, it, it, the only thing in the context is that they need to complete their responsibility of being faithful witnesses of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus. And unfortunately, there are people that are going to die for doing that, okay? So long story short, the martyrs who died are wondering, and of course, anyone in the, in the churches, if you were a, a Christian in you know, those seven churches and there had been people in your church that had been killed for faithfully preaching the gospel, okay? This is a message of encouragement for you to say, God has not abandoned them, God has not ignored them, they're not outside of God's grace. They're not outside of God's redemption. But their example is meant to spur us and motivate us to also be preaching the gospel because the, um, God is looking 
for more people to complete that work of maintaining the word of God and the, and the, the witness of Jesus, the testimony of Jesus. This is a very, very, this fifth seal is very, very different than the other four. It's basically, it, it, it's got, um, it, it's telling us that we need to keep on preaching the gospel. That's what we need to be doing. Okay. It's a very, very powerful, very, very deep, very intimate uh, passage, but that's, that's what it's saying here. Okay. Um, God is waiting for a time for the completion by the fellow servants and the brethren um, to complete that work and, and ultimately to, to suffer because of it. Okay. He's not looking for a certain number. He's looking for the completion of the work of preaching the gospel. Interesting point. Let me actually just kind of, uh, before I go on to the, the next seal, because actually and, and some, the next seal is longer, but it actually is the easier of the two. Um, let me just kind of stop right here and see, are there any kind of questions or, or even kind of any, any responses um, from you all? I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen. What do, you, what do you guys think of this, of the fifth seal of, of, the, uh, of the martyrs? Um, any any uh, comments or questions? Sounds good. Makes sense the way you lay it out. Okay. I, just I don't have any really big comment though, but. Uh, okay. What do you think, Melissa? That last statement you made about it's, it's not the number. It's the completion of the gospel. That's like a big light bulb moment for me. Wow. <sighs> So, um, and then that reminds me of um, the scripture that says that he that um, started the work, good work in you, will be faithful to complete it. <laughs> wow, that's just awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And again, this is not something brand new to Revelation. I mean, Jesus says, Matthew 24, 14, that the gospel, the kingdom, we preach in the whole earth as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Uh, 2 Peter 3. Uh, deals with the same question. How long is it until Jesus comes back? And and the response is, God's given people more time to repent. And that's the other thing too, is that in the midst of, um, <clears throat> in the midst of, I'll go ahead and start, go back to, to sharing here. In the midst of all of the, in a sense, scary things that we've seen with the first four seals, what would be the positive effect of God wanting there to be more preachers of the gospel? More preachers of the gospel would mean more people would repent. More people would, 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 would convert and, and, and become a part of the people of God. They would be saved. They would be, for, excuse me, they'd be forgiven. Okay. So, so this is an act of mercy. This is an act of, of, of the, it, it's, it, it's starting by the way to lay the seeds that this is how God wants to affect change. God wants to affect change by people repenting at the preaching of the gospel message. God doesn't want to affect change by threatening people with judgment and earthquakes and, and plagues. And because what we're going to learn in Revelation is that that doesn't change a lot of people's mind. Threatening people doesn't change a lot of people's mind. What does change is the faithful preaching of the gospel, calling them to repentance, and the change that brings in their life. And of course, that's the work that, that uh, God wants completed here. <clears throat> anyway. A lot of stuff there, and I think I to get my dissertation. I wrote like 14 pages just on those three verses, but basically, I'm just giving you all, all the uh, fruits of that right there, fruits of that labor. <clears throat> okay, so um, we got the uh, sixth seal here. All right, now as I read this, I want you to think to yourself, okay, we've got a group of people that are described in the fifth seal, and we've got a group of people that are described in the sixth seal. Groups of people will respond to God in different ways, and the groups of people would be identified with God in different ways. And I want you to ask the question, with which of these two groups do I want to be associated? Do I want to be associated with the seal five, the fifth seal people, or the sixth seal people? Okay, so just think about that question as I read through this. Verse 12, I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair. And the whole moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree cast its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up. 
and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence, literally the face, the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Okay. So, just a pretty simple question. Which group do you want to be associated with? Do you want to be associated with group five or group six? I think it's very clear we want to be associated with group six. Notice group five. They realize that God is the one that is holy and true. God is the faithful, sovereign Lord, the God that vindicates the righteous people. Here in six, we see that part of God's job is that he's got to be the judge. And he's got, he's got to deal with the problem of, of evil, okay? And if people don't want to repent, then, then unfortunately they have to suffer the consequences of that. But these people, they're not looking forward to this. They're not looking forward to God's vengeance. They're running from it. And they're running from it to the point to where they're actually, notice here in verse 16, what are they doing? They're talking to mountains and rocks. Hey, mountain, hey, rock, fall on us and hide us. I'm being a little facetious here because there's a lot of this stuff here that, were, that was not intended to be read literally, okay? Now, let me tell you, there have been some extremely nonsensical sermons about reading all the details of this literally, okay? But all of these images here in this sixth seal are drawn from other images in the Old Testament that were never meant to be read literally, okay? I'm going to give you the best example of explaining how this is, okay? Today, we, we describe, let's just talk about, let's talk about 9-11. 9-11, okay? I remember where I was when 9-11 took place. I remember where I was. I, I remember that I was a, a, a senior in high school. Uh, I remember I was in the second period, and I remember seeing it on, on, on TV there. I remember exactly uh, where I was at that time, okay? 9-11 was what we would call today, and I'm going to use my words carefully here, an earth-shattering event, an earth-shattering event, okay? That's a fair description. That's how we would describe something like that. Now, did the earth literally shake and shatter when 9-11 took place? No, no. That, I mean, that, that's a metaphor to describe something that just, it just shakes up our entire composure. It makes us feel really, really uncomfortable because of something that just took place, okay? These metaphors here, earthquakes, sun turning black, moon turning to blood, scar, stars falling from the sky, those are also earth shattering events. Doesn't mean the earth is actually shaking, it's just a metaphor of saying that there is political, social upheaval. But very clearly here, we're going to see in verse 17 that, it, that, that this is what it's going to be like during the great day of their wrath. Whose wrath? The one who sits on the throne and of the Lamb. Okay? Um, but, but the thing is, re reading this imagery literally doesn't make any sense. Okay? I'll, I'll give you an example. All right? Uh, it, it tries to give all these different metaphors. It's like the stars fell from the sky like a fig tree when its figs are shaken by a wind. Okay, it's like it's 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 like a tree when when the when the fruit falls off. Okay, the sky was split like a scroll when it's rolled up. Okay, and it's actually kind of weird though. A, a scroll that's rolled up. Anyone that's ever like rolled up a piece of paper. Okay, and then you and it's been rolled up for a very very long time. When you unroll it, you have to like weigh it down. Otherwise, it just rolls back up again. Okay, like you probably, you probably can figure out what that's like. That's what it is there. It's like a scroll that's been rolled up. It's been unrolled. You let it go. What happens? <sighs> Comes back together just like that. Okay, that's the imagery that's being used there. Okay, it's like there's there's some sort of like massive change in the heavens. And what's going on? What's going on here? We got even the remote places. We got mountains being moved out of their place, and islands, the remotest parts of the earth, the islands are being moved out of their place. Okay, now notice here, if a mountain is being moved out of its place then how can someone literally say, verse 16, how can you say to the mountains, fall on us, hide us? How can you go into the cleft of a mountain, into a cave? How can you say that if a mountain's been moved out of its place? You see, like, this stuff was never meant to be read literally, okay? This is, this is imagery. This is poetry. This is part of the visionary experience. It's drawn from the Old Testament. But guys, this, what, what he sees here was not an actual earthquake. He did not see the sun turn black. Okay, he did not see the moon turn red. He did not see little stars fall down to earth um, or the sky rolling up. Okay, this is, this is part of the imagery here, okay? 
And I can prove this to you. I can prove this to you. I can show you to where much more exaggerated, much more poetic language is used to describe what happened when Nebuchadnezzar in 586 came and destroyed Jerusalem, captured Jerusalem and destroyed the temple 2,500 years ago in 586, okay? So I'm gonna show you how this language works, okay? I'm just making this point because a lot of people that just, they just don't know any better. They just think I'm just gonna read this literally and it doesn't make any sense. It's just, it's nonsensical, okay? So uh, the best thing actually to do with this is actually is to not follow me so much, but to actually follow along in your Bible. Okay, we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. Okay, this, this I think, in, in all the time that I've ever taught this, Jeremiah 4 is the best place to go to demonstrate this particular point. Okay, <clears throat> all right, so let's get some context. Jeremiah chapter 4. Let's, uh, here, I'm going to go down to verse, <clears throat> okay. I remember Jeremiah, Jeremiah's writing in the sixth century. He's writing to the people uh, about this, this coming doom that's going to happen when uh, Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon, Babylon's in the north of, of Judah, is going to come down and it's going to uh, destroy the temple. It's going to take people into exile, into captivity, and it's going to basically conquer um, Jerusalem. Okay? Okay, so look at what God says in verse 6. Lift up a standard toward Zion. Seek refuge. Do not stand still, for I am bringing evil from the north, a great destruction from the north. Okay, we know that. Obviously, Babylon is from the north. We get that, okay? Verse 7. A lion has gone up from his thicket, and a destroyer of nations has set out. He has gone out from his place to make your land a waste. Your cities will be ruins without inhabitant. Okay? Now, is Nebuchadnezzar really a lion? No, he's a human being. But you see here, notice that these evil nations can be described as these ferocious conquering beasts, okay? He's gone out from his thicket, okay? You see the imagery here, we get that, okay? And what is he gonna do? He's gonna, he's gonna lay the land waste, okay? Your cities will be in ruin without inhabitant, okay? And then, by the way, that's, that's, that's poetic exaggeration because we do know that some people still remained there in Jerusalem. But, but notice the poetry that's being used here, waste, ruins without inhabitants, okay? Now, down in verse 23, that's where <clears throat> the vision really gets kicking, okay? I, I want, I'm going to read through this here, and I want you to tell me, because this is deliberately echoing another place in Scripture. And after, after I read this, I want you to tell me what passage of Scripture you think this is echoing, because you all know it. You've all read this other passage of Scripture a hundred times, okay? Look what he says, still in chapter 4, verse 23. I looked on the earth, and behold, it was formless and void. And to the heavens, and they had no light. I looked on the mountains, and behold, they were quaking, and all the hills moved to and fro. And I, I looked, and behold, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. I looked, and behold, the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were pulled down before the Lord, before his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be a desolation, yet I'm not going to execute a complete destruction. For this, the earth shall mourn, and the heavens above be dark. Notice there, the darkening of the heavens, okay? Because I have spoken, I have purposed, I will not change my mind, nor will I turn from it. Okay, so when you read that, verses 23, 24, and 25, what does that sound like? What is, what is that drawing from? My wife knows the answer, okay? Anybody else? Genesis chapter one. Obviously, okay. It, point by point there, what's going on here is an undoing of the Genesis one creation, okay? It's, it's the heavens that formerly had light, now there's no light, okay? The formless and void that was brought into order and, and peace is now brought back to formless and void, okay? The mountains that were peaceful are now quaking and the hills are being moved out of their place. And a place where there was the creation of humanity, now there's no man. And the birds of the heavens that were everywhere, now they fled. You see what you see what you know what's going on here in, in Jeremiah? This is a description of what's going to happen when Nebuchadnezzar comes down and defeats Jerusalem. But look at the look at the links that Jeremiah went to in order to poetically and metaphorically personify and to make the point. This is an earth-shattering event. Look at how this language was used of an event that happened 2,500 years ago. 
Because for, for the Israelites, when you destroy their temple, when you remove the Davidic king and you remove them out of the promised land, their entire world is turned upside down. And the best way to describe that was this particular vision. But notice, to read this literally would be ridiculous. It'd be absolutely ridiculous. That it's impossible to read literally. But guess what? This is a vision of something that took place 2,500 years ago. But you see that? To read that literally would not make any sense. So when similar language, notice there, earthquakes, the presence of God, the entire land being desolate, the heavens becoming darkened, the earth mourning, that is the earth personified now speaking in mourning, in, 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 in agony. We see that there in Revelation. We see that um, here. We see uh, the earthquake, that the heavens becoming darkened, that's the sun um, uh, turning, turning black and the moon becoming like blood, the moon removing its light, by the way. Um, these are earth-shattering events, okay? But they're not meant to be read literally. They're not meant to be read literally, okay? This, like, this is not, people think, oh, there's going to be some sort of like solar lunar eclipse. That means Jesus is coming back. Or the nonsensical things that have been said about the blood moons. That is not what this is talking about, okay? You can't date the return of Jesus by blood moons, okay? That's ridiculous. Please don't waste your money on those books, okay? Those prophets that preach that stuff, that's false. That is reading biblical imagery too literally, okay? Okay, so that's just kind of a point there. All right, so, so we see earth-shattering events, okay? When God comes and judges, I mean, everyone's going to know. It's not going to be some sort of secret rapture where it's going to be hidden and no one's going to know about it. No, when, when it comes time for God to judge, everyone's going to know about it. Everything's going to be, be moved about, Okay. Move down to verse 15. <clears throat> I want you to count the number of persons in this particular group, okay? The kings of the earth, the great men, the commanders, the rich, the strong, every slave, and free man. How many is that? Seven. Seven, okay. Do you think that's a coincidence in Revelation? We know better. We know better. So no, notice, notice how seven as a as a number describing the completeness of humanity um, can can be shown here without actually using the number seven. Okay, um, so we just we, it's just another way to kind of be careful. Sometimes the concept can actually be there without actually the word being there. Okay, so the number seven doesn't show up, but clearly we've got seven different things here, um, and that's important. Okay, so this is it's just a way of kind of describing all of humanity. We got the kings, great people, commanders. They got the rich and the strong, okay? Those people that, by the way, are used to being out in public. They're used to being out in front of other people. But what are they doing now? They're hiding. Now they're running away. Now they don't want to be seen in public, okay? Okay? And, of course, you got every slave and free man. So that, by the way, encompasses everybody. And they're hiding themselves. They're running away from these caves, from the rocks, and from the mountains, okay? And what are they saying? They're saying, by the way, they're saying to the mountains and the rocks, again, personification, for a couple of reasons. One, because the mountains have already been lifted up. And two, because we don't talk to mountains. We don't talk to rocks. You don't read that literally. We just don't do that, okay? Um, they don't answer your calls to fall and to hide you from God's face, God's presence, and from the wrath of the Lamb, okay? Now, this, by the way, um, is also drawing on the Old Testament, okay? Uh, so where we want to go here is Hosea. Hosea, the first of the minor prophets in Hosea chapter 10. <clears throat> okay. Okay. And start in verse 7. Okay. Now, a little, little context of Hosea, just very quickly. Um, Hosea uh, is in the 8th century. Okay. So Hosea is kind of a, a contemporary of like Isaiah. And uh, so this is, this is back when... When when, is, um, when, when, uh, when the Israelites had their ten tribes to the north and their two tribes to the south, we do know that eventually the ten tribes are going to get conquered and destroyed by the Assyrians. That happens in 722. Okay, so just kind of recap: uh, the Assyrians from Assyria they come and they conquer the northern ten tribes in 722, and the Babylonians, a different nation with a different king two centuries later in 586, they come down and they take over the last two kingdoms in 586, okay? So this is earlier. 
So what, is, what does Hosea say? Verse 7, Samaria, which by the way is the capital of, of that northern region, will be cut off with her king like a stick on the surface of the water. Also the high places of Avon, the sin of Israel, will be destroyed. Thorn and thistle will grow on their altars. They will say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. This was, this was said about the destruction of the northern tribes in the 8th century BC, 2,800 years ago. You see what Revelation is doing? Revelation is drawing on these images, both from Jeremiah and also here from Hosea, of these images and this, this, this heavy, poetic, metaphorical imagery that was used by the prophets to describe these earth-shattering events. And notice that these earth-shattering events were, were not just towards evil people. They were towards the people of God who had compromised, the people of God that had compromised. Okay? Because Revelation is, by the way, trying to take these visions and encourage us to not compromise so that we don't suffer the consequences of these things. So by the way, that, that we have that phrase there, um, saying to the high places, uh, they say to the mountains, cover us, fall on us. That is directly out of Hosea chapter 10 and verse 8, which, by the way, um, was dealing with a threat that came to pass in the year 722 B.C. Okay, so that's what they say. So they're saying this in verse 16. They want to be hidden from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Okay, now we don't learn anything else about that. We don't learn anything else about what the wrath looks like. We don't learn about what it's like when God shows up. Okay, we don't know that. Okay, we just know the great day of the wrath has come. But notice the last question. This last question, this is a very interesting question here. Who is able to stand? Who is able to stand? Just an interesting question there. Okay, because it, it, it's almost as if the end of this, notice because this is the end of the chapter. Okay, it doesn't immediately go into the seventh seal. It goes into this long, entire chapter long pause of answering this question, okay? Who is able to stand? Who's able to stand? The very next time that we get this verb standing in the book of Revelation, I'm just gonna scroll down here, okay? <clears throat> let's see, um, let's see. Oh, I need to just go back. Chapter 7, uh, <clears throat> verse 9. Okay, 7 verse 9. Okay. After these things, what does he see? I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues. And what are they doing? Standing before the throne and before the Lamb. What are they doing? Wearing white robes. Palm branches were in their hands. So the answer to the question, who is able to stand in the midst of God's judgment on the day of his wrath? When the kingdom ultimately comes, and God shows up and the wrath of the Lamb shows up, who is able to stand? Look at, look at the encouragement here. The encouragement is, it's, it's to believers. It's the, it's the Christians, people from every nation, tribe, and people in tongue. They are the ones that are standing before the one seat upon the throne, before the lamb. They're clothed in white robes, and they've got those victory palm branches. Remember those palm branches we saw in all those coins with the goddess Nike? Now these people are the ones that have conquered, okay? So this long pause in chapter 7 between seals 6 and 7 is meant to give some purpose and focus to the people of God as to how they're supposed to live and how they're supposed to obey and what they're supposed to do and what they're supposed to look like. Okay, so while the end of chapter six ends with that question, and it's really, it's a rhetorical question because we know, we know the answer is who is able to stand? The people of God are able to stand, okay? Now, the, the great people, the kings, and all those people that are, that are opposed to God, that want to run away from God, that want to hide from God, that want to have nothing to do with God, yeah, they're going to get what's coming to them. But the people of God are able to stand that. They can have confidence on the day of judgment. Okay, so to me, I think that gives a very, very interesting, this, this entire, thing, like, when I, when I read this, I, I look at chapter six, and I walk away with, with two feelings. One, 
first feeling is don't compromise. Don't get too comfortable with this world because the, the things that I'm comfortable with in this world, they can all be taken away through conquest, through war, through famine, through death, through the judgment of God. But what I do need to do is I need to do my part in completing the work and the commission that's been given to the church of being faithful witnesses of the gospel of the kingdom of God so that I can have confidence and I can stand on the day of judgment. I think it's a, it's a very, it's, a, it's an interesting way of both spurring on those who have compromised in the church that are reading this message to not compromise and to shape up and to be more faithful and to encourage those people who are faithful to keep at it because there's a good reward set out for them. Anyway, um, I'll uh, stop sharing here and open it up for any kind of uh, questions or comments or, or I, I actually, I, I am curious. Um, the question I initially asked, how does this make you feel when you read these things? How does it make you feel? Do you feel frightened? Do you feel scared? Do you feel encouraged? Do you feel unsettled? Uh, I'm curious about that. I'm curious what sort of rhetorical effect does this, uh, does this chapter have for you? I feel encouraged because, uh, I mean, it's kind of been our commission from the start is to always preach the gospel and to stay uncontaminated from this age, this world, and from all the different things that can weigh you down and distract you. And uh, so, I mean, all that will come as a consequence, you know, to people that don't listen. But, um, you know, and it's, I mean, the thing I always have to encourage myself is to keep um, sharing the gospel with people we're not responsible for their reaction or whether they believe or whether they don't believe and you never know how you might change those people it's like pam was talking about those young uh, kids with rebecca uh, years ago and i've talked to rebecca several times through the years and a lot of those kids lives have been changed to the good for a lot of years to come through their adult life you know, we might not see that result, but talking to her, I could see where they had very good results in their life because of a lot of the things that happened out of that fellowship. So you never know what's going to happen and how people are going to react. But our responsibility is just to obey and, and do what God asks us to do. Yeah. So it's always encouraging to know that eventually we're going to get to the to the end of the tunnel. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Oh, and speaking of the end, uh, it's, it's interesting there that at the end of chapter six, we do get to the day of judgment, but the book of Revelation doesn't end there. It doesn't say, okay, well, you've got to the day of judgment, game over, like, let's just kind of stop right there. We see that the visions are going to continue to come and they're going to recycle and they're going to show up in a different way. So people that think that, oh, you need to, I should have made this point earlier. People that think that, oh, you just need to read the book of Revelation as if it's this ongoing timeline of events to the end of the age, what do you do when the day of judgment comes at the end of chapter six? What do you do with the rest of the book? It just doesn't work. It just, the hypothesis just falls apart. So, um, so yeah, thanks for reminding of that. And, and thank you for your comments. I appreciate that. Um, Melissa, I see your hand up. I don't know if that was from the last time or not. That's from the last time. Okay. And I should do, I should call on Hannah right now and she's got her mouth full of food. <laughs> Um, I'm just, I'm just teasing. You don't have to say anything. What do you think, Pam? Well, I'm in the same camp as Greg. When you put it the way you um, presented the whole thing, um, it's, it is encouraging. You know, for the longest time, I always thought it was a very fearful time, uh, uncertain of the outcomes for you, whether you were in that time alive or whether you were in that time um, dead or resurrected. You know, it just, there was just so much that seemed frightening, kind of scary. <laughs> and listening to it today, yes, I, I definitely have a greater understanding. Hopefully I can continue in that and um, it helps me to be more encouraged. 
thank God. <laughs> I think for me, I'm usually, um, I feel like I grew up being taught kind of like that was all literal stuff. I'm not even really sure what I grew up knowing, but um, it helps me to know, first of all, that that's not literal. And second of all, that, <laughs> I'm gonna get on camera, um, that, I lost my train of thought. Not literal. Not literal. Um, Jackson. <laughs> but just that, um, I guess also that it's like that divide between the people who are fearing God and, and fearing his face versus those of us who have been faithful and that kind of thing. I think I still have some anxiety about whether I'm faithful enough, <laughs> but we'll, we'll keep working on that. <laughs> one question, I, not question, but one statement I was just thinking about. Remember when, when uh, the angel appeared to Daniel? I mean, what did he do? <laughs> I mean, he fell um, with his face to the ground and he was afraid to move. I mean, I think that that sort of um, being in the presence of God and being in the presence of the Lord Jesus and, and all the believers, it, it's going to be kind of full of awe and wonder <laughs> rather than, you know, fear and, and being afraid. But anyway, just, anyway, just made me think about that when Hannah was talking. <laughs> Now, this is passage in, in Romans 5, verse 2, where it talks about how we exult in the hope of the glory of God. We exult in the hope of the glory of God. So there's the hope of that future glory. We have that hope, but it's ultimately something in the future. But our response right now is that we exult in it. And actually, I read a, a really good translation that said, we don't use the word exult anymore. We use the word celebrate. Let's use the word celebrate. And I was like, I like that. We celebrate in the hope of the glory of God. And I, and I wonder if, if that's not a, a better response for us, you know? I mean, yeah, I, I do think as Christians, we, we need to remain humble. We, we need to, you know, have a healthy kind of reverence for God. Um, that doesn't mean that we walk around on eggshells all the time. I think if, we, if we're living faithfully, we can have confidence and we can have trust that, that God's gonna, you know, uh, bring us in, into his kingdom when Jesus comes back. And, and that gives us cause for, exalting or celebrating and uh having a good attitude about it so um you know I, I think maybe we could do more with that so i don't know yeah. um, i i agree and then and then and just looking at romans 5 2 and then going on in 3 and not only this but we also exalt or celebrate in our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance proven character and proven character hope and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. So that should give us some great encouragement to go back to, you know, um, the uh, verses in Revelation to not be afraid, to increase our focus, to increase our concentration on the things of God and spreading the gospel message, come what may, regardless of the consequences, because we know that even if we are martyred, we will be raised and raised to righteousness and a great reward and the presence of God in Christ. And yeah. What's better than that? I yeah. can't think of anything. <clears throat> yeah, good point. Good comments here. <clears throat> well, it's good. I was, I was really worried because a lot of a lot of complicated stuff in this passage. It was like, oh, I hope that I don't lose everybody in the midst of it all, but it looks like nobody's falling asleep. So, um, no. so I'm glad. So, um, did, did Jackson have any comments? Uh, did I, did I meet with his <laughs> prophetic expertise approval? <laughs> um, I think I missed some portions of it cause I was on a meeting until a little after. Okay. Fix our time. You but, missed a lot. 
Yeah, but I did catch, I did catch, um, I can't remember exactly. I think, I think when I was walking in, you were talking about um, the, the different, well, the meaning of them being dead. And uh, that was, um, I, I enjoyed a lot <clears throat> your clarity of explanation on the proper way to interpret a lot of the individual words and phrases because there is just so much vague ambiguity that any old teacher on YouTube or wherever you look is going to apply and you know so it was nice just to have clarity of of um you know the text so thank you <laughs> all right so never grow old got it <laughs> i'm just kidding so I, I i learned most of my stuff actually from older teachers older writers so okay uh well if there aren't any other uh comments i'll, I'll stop recording we can kind of go a little more casually.